Thank you, Brother Steve, for the beautiful prelude. It's a thirsty time in our, our earth, and as the deer pants for the waters, we seek the Lord, and in this time of worship, we come prepared to enter into the presence of God. So whether you are worshiping with us online right now, and for those here in person in the sanctuary, welcome on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. By God's grace, we continue to worship together. God is good. Amen? Amen. Amen. One of the reasons that we give thanks to God is because of life. No day is guaranteed. No year is guaranteed. But we have some special milestone birthdays to celebrate in the month of July, and always on the second Sunday we do that. So this month, we want to give special recognition and thank the Lord for and pray for um, our birthday celebrants, Kathy Anderson, turning 89 this month, Elma Hooks, turning 94, Galen Saylor, turning 94, and Ed Robles, turning 95. So we, we rejoice and pray for these dear ones, asking God's blessings for health and strength and that they might know they're loved today. From the older ones to the younger ones, Sunday school is starting up again right now. This is the first Sunday for summer Sunday school. So following our time with the children, Sermon on the Steps, the children ages four and up will go to uh, Sunday school. And at that time also, we appreciate the support with the, the masks. After the children have departed, you're free to take your masks off. And, um, and we can, at that point, uh, share without the muffle. <laughs> uh, there's a, regarding stewardship and always continuous process improvement, our copier machine has some codes that are put onto it. So if you have a, a, a regular user of the machine, please contact Karen this week to get your code for the copy machine. This is baseball season. I'm loving the baseball and uh, all, the, all the excitement as we come up on the all-star break. Right in line with that, our next movie night is in 12 days from right now, 12 days. It's the Sandlot, 8 o'clock at the point. Please invite your neighbors. There's going to be uh, some drink, some water, some COVID-safe popcorn, and most of all, just a privilege to be together at the point. So invite out your, your, your friends for that. The uh, Tuesday at 10 Bible study is continuing for another two weeks, the 13th and the 20th. This, this Tuesday, it's John chapter 2 and verse 18, beginning there, and then there will be a break until the latter part of August, the 24th of August. Huff and Puffers, you're on hiatus for the summer, but you're not on hiatus from fitness. So Huff and Puffers and everybody else too, keep up your fitness with your range of motion. Every Sunday morning, I've been doing this for years, I go somewhere, and I stretch out, and I do some push-ups, and I get ready for Sunday worship. So keep that up, huff and puffers, your cardio, your interval training, your strength training at home. Keep it going. Your contributions do matter, and if, if you haven't read the, June and, the July and August newsletter, please check out the stewardship section, because we are, there's more than a lull right now in the giving, and it's, uh, it's significant. So look at that and see what you can do with the many ways that God has blessed you in your lives to continue supporting the ministry of the church. We are um, beginning today, there is a special eight-week sermon series entitled, Here Comes the Future. Here Comes the Future, and Pastor Rosalind's going to kick it off this Sunday with a, an excellent sermon, so we're, we're excited for you to, to receive this as we are uh, preparing for what the Lord has coming. And all these are reasons to rejoice. Uh, if you are new or recently returned to the church, please come to our fellowship time following the service, loving, lovingly prepared by our membership commission, and let's have some extended time of fellowship following this service. And with that in mind, and as we are preparing ourselves to worship, it's just the most natural thing to sing the doxology. And so Chelsea 
and Kelly are going to lead us in the doxology now as we gather together to worship and praise God. Good morning. Please rise in body or in spirit and join in the responsive call to worship. Psalm 16 says, what can I give back to God for the blessings he has poured out on me? I'll lift high the cup of salvation, a toast to God. I'll complete what I promised God I would do. Family of God, let us worship God who has poured out blessings on us all. Let us pray. Lord, your word says, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. We know you draw us to you, Savior. May our worship honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Be the center of our lives. 
lift our eyes. We lift our eyes to heaven, and we wrap our lives around your light. We lift our eyes to heaven, to you, to you, oh Christ, be the center of our lives, be the place we fix our eyes, be the center of our lives, oh Christ, be the center of our lives, be the place we fix our eyes, be the center of our lives. I think it's okay to sit now. Please join me in the call to confession. Scripture says, happy are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Seeking the blessings of forgiveness, let us acknowledge our need for God. I guess you can't join in here. Oh, there we go. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us the consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from the past, that we cannot change. Open us to future in which we can be changed. And grant us to go more in your likeness and image through Christ Jesus, King of Kings. Let us continue our confession in silent prayer. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear now the words of new life. Friends, let us remember again that in Christ we are forgiven. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is the steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes us from our transgressions. Thanks be to God. All right, I scare my own self. Do I have some young people in the house? Come on forward, y'all. Hello, hello. We are all in this together. Yes, we are. Oh, good. Come on up, everybody. I have something I want to share with you. If you can't all sit, sit up here because we have to keep our distance, you're welcome to spread out in front of me, too, as you wish, wherever you'd like to be. Fantastic. So I have a question. You know when you're at school or on the playground? Yes. Do you notice that even among your friends, that there's somebody who tends to take the leadership. Maybe one of you are one of those people who kind of takes the lead. Is that true? Not always. Well, some. Well, I'm not thinking that you have to be the one who has to tag everybody. It's the person who's saying, hey, let's go play tag. Or, hey, let's go play four square. 
or somebody who says, well, we need to get teams, so we're gonna have you be a leader and that you're gonna be the next team captain, okay? That's the leader, that's what the leader does. They say, this is what we're gonna do. And that's sometimes really important, but sometimes being a leader is hard. You know, sometimes some people don't want to follow what you're saying to do. They might rebel against you, yeah. They might wanna take their ball and go home. So being a leader sometimes is hard. And you do what your mommy says. Your mommy's your leader of you. That's true for all of you, your mommies and your daddies, right? And your grandparents. There are some other natural leaders, that's for sure. Well, the Bible has a lot to teach us about leadership and that God is always working in the lives of God's people, calling and equipping. That's the term I want you guys to learn, calling and equipping. Can you say that with me? Calling, calling and equipping. And that means, equipping means to make it possible for someone to lead in order to bring God's will to pass, bring God's will into this world. So there are a couple of people that we want to focus on right now. Have you ever heard of Moses or Joshua? And you've heard of Noah and the Great Flood. And there's another guy named Moses. And you might know him as the baby who was put into a basket into the Nile. And then he was saved. He was drawn up out of the water. That's the Moses I'm talking about. And he's the same guy who tried to save his people who were in bondage, servants in Egypt. And they didn't like that. But he didn't wait for God first. So he kind of messed up. And because he messed up, he ran away and he went into this desert area and he became a shepherd and one day he was sitting there just minding his sheep you might think of it as minding his own business and there was a bush that just burst into flames and it didn't it didn't burn away it was a very special bush that's the Moses we're talking about and God spoke to him through this burning bush and said, Moses, I want you to lead my people out of Egypt. You know what Moses said now? This is the guy who tried to do it you know, a couple of decades before and he wasn't ready yet. He said, oh God, no, I, I really can't do that. <laughs> um, that that's a, a job bigger than I am. And, Moses, and God said, no, I'm calling you to do this job and I'm gonna give you the skills. I'm going to equip you to do what I've asked you to do. So called and equipped. There's another guy named Joshua who was one of the men who helped Moses and helped him while those Israelites were wandering all over the desert. You might have heard about this 40-year journey all through the desert. Do you remember when the Red Sea was, was parted for them? They got away from Pharaoh. Do you remember that story? And the Red Sea parted and then they could walk right through the Hebrew people walked right through a whole big river, the, the, the Red Sea. They got away. Well, Joshua was there with them when that happened. And he was there when God gave the law to Moses. And he was one of the folks that went over and checked out the land that was called the Promised Land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And he came back and he gave a really good report to Moses. So, when Moses knew that he wasn't gonna go into that promised land, he had been told, you're not going into the promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey. He knew that the people still needed a leader. And he asked God for help with that. And God said, I want you to go pick Joshua. I want Joshua to be the leader that will take the people into the land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land. You see, the Bible is full of stories about people like you and me. People who might have been scared or nervous or didn't want to be the leader. People who surely made mistakes. But the Bible tells us that God wants to be known to us and to lead us and that God wants to call people to help in that purpose, to, be known, that, to help God be known to us and to lead us. So with God's help, we're all able to do things that we don't think we're able to do. 
See, God has been working in their lives just as God is working in your life. God has called and equipped, say it with me, called and equipped so that the people of the Bible will obey God and he will call and equip you so that the people you are sharing God's love with and message to will listen also as long as you are listening first to God. You might not know what it is you're being called to do yet. That's okay. Life is a good journey. And we just stay close to God, read the Bible, go to Sunday school, learn more, and pray. And then God will call and equip us. All of us. And all of you. Will you bow with me in prayer? You can pray after me if you would. Lord God, thank you for calling us and equipping us that we will help your will be done on earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Great to have you here. Good morning. I want to introduce to you Juliana Smith who is uh, from Baltimore, just flew into San Diego a couple of days ago. Uh, Juliana is 22 years old, uh, just graduated from the University of Baltimore. And she's going to sing a beautiful song called The Crucifixion. Um, and the lyrics are quite interesting. They were discovered um, from the writings of a monk about a um, 1,000 to 1,200 years ago. So these are very old writings and translated then into English and a very modern composer named Samuel Barber um, set the lyrics to music um, in a very, very haunting manner. So we welcome Juliana this morning and look forward to hearing the crucifixion. And it's because of that sacrifice and commitment and love that we come with confidence, bringing our souls before the Lord in prayer. So may we bow now and lift up our hearts to God. 
gracious and loving creator, sometimes the words for us are just not there. You are so amazing that our words and thoughts of how best to praise you pale in comparison to the splendors of your name. You are the Almighty. You are the Redeemer. You are grace, never-ending, and the embodiment of love itself. And when we come to you in prayer, like now, sometimes words fail us in what to say. We lift up our concerns, and yet sometimes they seem so small in comparison to the tribulations encountered across your creation. How can our problems compare to disasters which people face or the fighting that surrounds people trying to escape or the horrors that no child should ever experience. Lord God, sometimes when we come to you to pray, we are clueless as to what we should ask for. You know the thoughts in our minds and the desires of our hearts, and there are times when they conflict Sometimes, God, we want what is not always the best for us. And there are times that we long to hold on to the things we should let go of. There are times when really the best thing we can do is just pray, thy will be done. In these moments, dear God, we are so very thankful for the lessons of your son, Jesus Christ, teaching us the words to pray when our own are insufficient. Lord God, we give you thanks for all your gifts to us, for our daily food today, for health, for each breath we take, for freedom to choose, and for the gifts of your word, your power, and your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed. O oh God, when we consider how you have entrusted so much to us, may we be worthy of that trust. May we be a people who are unafraid to live as fully and as richly as you want us to live. Help us, O oh God, as followers of Jesus, to multiply all that you have given us, to risk spreading your word and perhaps see it misunderstood to gamble by loving those whom others think worthy only of hate, to take chances by doing good to those who have not done good to us. Help us to be faith-filled and desire to increase your glory and your goodness in this world. Make us people who share in both word and deed that which you have given to us. We pray for the church gathered here today and around the world, that it may encourage all of its members to discover and develop and use all their gifts, those of nature and those of grace. We pray this morning for those who are poor in body or in spirit, for those oppressed and heavy laden, for those sick or in despair, Minister by your spirit and by us to all those whom we've lifted up before your throne of grace. Help us to walk faithfully in the path of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray special birthday blessings for Kathy and Elma, Ed and Galen. We continue to pray for discernment and your spirit's guidance for the pastor nominating committee's holy work as they continue to receive PIFs and interact with candidates to become the installed pastor in accordance with your will. Acknowledging that our very lives and all we have comes from your hand, we gratefully dedicate our offerings to you. Hear our prayers and give us confidence and courage that we might join our voices together, praying now with the words that Christ himself taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. of the table to share with you and I also don't want to fall off the stairs so thank you for understanding where we are right now oh my friends pastor Gary and I know of your interest to have someone relatively young to lead you bravely into your future someone with lots of of personal, spiritual, and professional maturity, who will be deeply interested in you personally and in this church on the bluff, and who will ask lots of questions, be prepared to have answers for lots of questions. Whoever comes will promise to serve you with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. Through whoever is chosen, Pastor Gary and I are confident that God will bless you, and we trust that you will bless the new pastor who will be called to you. And all of this excited anticipation is thoroughly biblical. The people of God have often experienced transitions in pastoral leadership. In other words, the transitions you all have known over the past several years isn't all that unusual. In fact, Leadership transitions are part and parcel of what it means to be the people of God. Now, while we trust God's timing for the precise when of transition, it is good to begin focusing our attention on the pastoral transition that is pending. And what better way than an eight-week sermon series, Here Comes the Future. And today's passage comes to us from Numbers chapter 27, verses 12 to 23, and I'll be reading it from the message. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer? Come, Holy Spirit. Come with the fire and burn. Come with the rain and cleanse. Come with the light and reveal. Convict us. Convert us, consecrate us, until we do something. For we pray in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. God said to Moses, Climb up into the Abarim Mountains and look over the land that I am giving to the people of Israel. When you have had a good look, you'll be joined to your ancestors in the grave. Yes, you also, along with Aaron, your brother. This goes back to the day when the congregation quarreled in the wilderness of Zin, and you didn't honor me in holy reverence before them in the matter of the waters, the waters of Meribah, quarreling at Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. Moses responded to God. Let God, the God of the spirits of everyone living, set a man over this community to lead them, to show the way ahead and bring them back home so God's community will not be like a, sh a sheep without a shepherd. 
And God said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, the spirit is in him, and place your hand upon him. Stand him before Eleazar the priest in front of the entire congregation, and commission him with everyone watching. Pass your magisterial authority over to him, so that the whole congregation of the people of Israel will listen obediently to him. He is to consult with Eleazar the priest, who, using the oracle Urim, will prayerfully advise him in the presence of God. He will command the people of Israel, the entire community, in all their comings and goings. Moses followed God's orders. He took Joshua, stood him before Eleazar the priest in front of the entire community. He laid his hands on him and commissioned him, following the procedures God had given Moses. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so let's get some historical context, shall we? 3,500 years before, the Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt. It was an awful life. It was nonstop labor and oppression. Desperate, the Hebrews cried out to God for help. God heard and determined when the time was right to rescue them. We know this part. God raised up a leader named Moses, and he was not a very impressive leader at first. But he did grow into the job. God used him to free the Hebrew people from Pharaoh's clutches, delivering them out of Egypt in an amazing and miraculous event called the Exodus. That is the key event in all of Jewish history, as they understand it. The Israelites turned out to be a whiny group of refugees and travelers. Travelers who grumbled over changes in the schedule and the weather, who complained about differences in food and groused about minor inconveniences. Now, I'm not talking about the quiet grumbling and complaining. No. They were loud, they were obnoxious, and this was a never-ending complaint all the way across the desert. The first weeks of their trip were rough. They were on their way to a wonderful place called the Promised Land, but they seemed to have hated every minute. There was simply no pleasing them. What should have been a short journey took a 40-year path. They wandered around and in the desert until all the whiners, the complainers, and the naysayers died off. Until all of the negative, harping pessimists were dead and buried. They wandered until God had what God needed, a more willing, positive, faithful group of people to work with. This journey, recorded for us in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, forever serves as a tutor and a guide, and perhaps a warning to local congregations about what it means to live together to travel together as the people of God. We need this Old Testament travelogue because quite frankly, we're a lot like those Hebrew refugees. It is easy for us to forget whose trip we're on. It's God's trip, remember? And sometimes we succumb to pessimism and grumpiness. God had to work hard for 40 years to root out the Israelites' pessimism and grumpiness, and God did most of it by waiting them out. 
And here, at the end of the Book of Numbers, Moses is the last one left. The last man standing, so to speak. And we can sort of imagine him stooping. But he was the last of that original generation of refugees. Along with God, Moses has borne the brunt of their whining, complaining, and fractiousness their negative and fearful thinking about the future, their incessant longing for the life they used to have. You remember the one they used to complain about when they were there, back in Egypt. But here, in Numbers 27, God leads Moses up into the Abarim Mountains, east of the Dead Sea, and God wants Moses to see the future that's laid out before him. So faithfully, Moses climbs to the top of Mount Nebo, today located in Jordan, 2,700 feet above sea level and about 4,000 feet above the Dead Sea itself. Moses could see everything from there. The entire Jordan River Valley, it was laid out before him. Snow there on Mount Hermon, far to the north at 9,000 feet and to the west, the hills above the Mediterranean Sea. In short, he can see the promised land, a good land with brooks and rivers and springs and lakes and streams running out of the hills through the valley, a land of wheat and barley and vines and figs and pomegranates, of oil, of olives, of honey. These seven agricultural products still hold special status in the area of the Transjordan. They're known as the seven species of the land of Israel. To this day, they continue to flourish and hold a special sacred status within Judaism and Jewish life. At any rate, for anyone stuck in the desert for 40 years, it must have been a beautiful sight. Views like we might enjoy from the top of Cuyamaca, overlooking San Diego right out to the Pacific Ocean. Okay, just a sidebar. How many of you have climbed to the top of Cuyamaca? Anybody here? Oh, good. At least some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the view takes Moses' breath away, especially since he can only look at it. He'll never actually go there. And he's known that for a while but he had containment over his leadership, a constraint that he would not lead these people into the promised land itself. So what God says to Moses here is no surprise to him. This constraint is a consequence of a leadership mistake that he made back in Numbers chapter 20. And there, once again, the people were rebelling against Moses and complaining about his leadership the journey was taking too long, this food, it was tiresome, the water was scarce. The people were sick and tired of this whole thing. They were ready to give up on it, give up on God, and definitely give up on Moses. They just wanted to die and have it over with. Exasperated, under assault, Moses turns to God for help, and God told him to assemble the people around a really huge rock commanding the rock to yield its water. Just speak to it, nothing more. But you know the story. Moses was just fed up. And instead of doing what God told him to do, he took matters into his own hands. And first he hauled off and yelled at the people. And then he struck the rock. Not once, but twice. And of course, the water did gush from the rock, enough to quench the thirst of all of the people and all of the animals. And in spite of Moses' disobedience, God proved himself to be generous and holy and powerful that day. But not like he wanted to. God wanted Moses to model the trust in God to the people. Moses blew it. He'd become so personally offended 
that he became just like one of them. An out of control whiner and complainer who refused, refused to be guided by God. And that's when God told him, Moses, dude, you are not going in to that promised land. You will not lead these people into the land that I am giving them. Talk about regret. But you know that the Bible is no fairy tale. It's about real people, real life, and in this case, real constraints and consequences that can accompany leadership. When it comes to pastoral leadership, sometimes pastors make mistakes that limit their ability to lead. Sometimes congregations limit their pastor's leadership by refusing to cooperate. Sometimes pastors aren't gifted for the next phase of ministry that a church needs. Sometimes God calls pastors elsewhere. Sometimes the pastors are intentional interims who do a special kind of transitional ministry work that is preparing the way for someone else. Constraints and limitations are a normal component of pastoral leadership. We see it with Moses, and we see it here on the, in the church on the bluff, where one expression of leadership does come to an end, so another can begin. This is what God covers with Moses in verses 12 to 14. But of course, there must be pastoral leadership. Moses knows this, and God knows this too. We see that in verses 15 to 17. Moses cares deeply about these people. They care deeply about him in spite of their whining and rebellion. He asks God to give them a new pastor, a good one. Someone, as he says, to lead them, to show the way ahead, to bring them to their new home so that, as Moses puts it, they won't be like sheep without a shepherd. We've talked about sheep before. They were the most important animal in the ancient Middle East, and they were also the most hapless. Economically valuable, to be sure, essential for food and for worship, and utterly defenseless, lost in every respect without a shepherd, being vulnerable to theft, to injury, to getting lost. Moses knows these people well. They are dear to him, and they have driven him crazy with worry. They need a new shepherd, and so he asks God to appoint one. And there, in verses 18 to 21, we see that God has this covered, having already selected Joshua as Moses' successor. And now Moses is to commission Joshua in public. Why Joshua? Well, we meet Joshua back in Exodus 17, where Moses appointed him to lead an important battle, which he succeeded very well. And next, he appears to us in Exodus 33, serving as Moses' assistant in the tent of meeting. And then in Numbers 11, Joshua serves as one of the 12 spies who are sent out on the reconnaissance mission to the promised land. Ten spies come back, shaking in their boots. The land is too big. The people are too big. The challenges are too big. Even the grapes are too big. They're too big for the Israelites to handle. These ten spies recommended abandoning all plans to enter that land. Only Joshua and Caleb recommend confidence in God. Only they believe in God's gift of the land. Only they see a future there. Joshua is the right person for the job ahead. He has the right experience, the right disposition, the vision, 
the right leadership convictions, the style, the right kind of relationship with God, he is a good choice to shepherd these people into the future, to lead them where God wants them to go. So Moses lays his hand on Joshua in public, commissions him as a replacement and successor, turns over his authority to Joshua, letting him lead, guide, and pastor the people in his place. And here we are. You are dear to Pastor Gary and to me. We know something about the challenges that you have faced as a church and in your personal lives. We know some of your griefs, some of your anxieties and hopes and dreams for the future. We know your missional potential. We have prayed with you to have a wise and faithful shepherd. Our passage ends by saying simply that Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua stood him before Eleazar the priest in front of the entire community. He laid his hands on him and commissioned him just as God had outlined. In other words, Moses brought Joshua forward and made his leadership visible in the sight of all. Something like that will happen here soon. The whole process will eventually culminate sometime after your chosen pastor officially arrives, when you and the presbytery will hold a special and formal service of installation. But as we can see in Numbers 27, transitions in pastoral leadership begin in the heart of God, begin in the plans that God has for you. In your case, God is planting these plans in the hearts of your pastor nominating committee. Bill Oshman, Sarah Dawson, Amy Hull, Mike Patton, Gary Strawn, Barbara Welsh Osga, Barbara Van Meter. Your hearts are being tuned to the pastor who will be called here. And God is even now planting these plans in the heart of that pastor who is to be discovered. These plans of God are well underway in your hearts and in ours. Here comes the future, and it is good. Thanks be to God. I would invite you to stand as we are going to sing. We all are one in mission. We all are one in call. Our varied gifts united by Christ, the Lord of all.
have the gift of God who knows us and leads us and calls pastors. This is a wonderful gift. May your hearts know that gift as security. And now, go in the peace, purpose, protection, and power of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.